We'll kick those tires and start that virtually fake fire. Today is a glorious day. Now, every day is a glorious day, as my next guest will remind us, because each and every one of us is a miracle. But today is extra glorious because I have the privilege to sit down with a living legend, someone who's going to tell us like it is. And my regular listeners are very well aware that I actually do not know much. But what I do know is that we are about to go on a grand tour of musical excellence with a genre-bending, diversified, genre-defying, Grammy Award-winning legend who is somehow, someway, sitting here with me virtually. This is, this is life, y'all. Life is crazy. God can do anything. And I'm so honored to welcome the one and the only Aaron Neville to the show. Aaron, thanks for being thanks here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, man. All right. So as a little icebreaker, uh, we're obviously going to talk about your book because you have an incredible book, which I did the audio book. You read. So if you really want to get the real raw, the the down low, you got to listen to it because Aaron tells it like it is. And it's fantastic. I just listened to it on a road trip. Um, now, Aaron, you're obviously incredibly cool and suave, but I noticed in the book that uh, you weren't always cool and suave. Uh, you share some interesting anecdotes. Uh, could you tell me about your relationship with carrying cigarettes and matches in your pants? Yeah, that was like uh, about 12 years old, you know, thought I was grown. I used to buy L and M cigarettes and I had to strike anywhere matches that I carry in my back pocket. I don't know why the back pocket, but and one day I uh talking sitting on the concrete porch talking to this girl Jenny and her sister Catherine and I got an itch back then I've done it and the matches ignited and I had to come out of my pants in front of Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he was catching fire at an early age, obviously. So mm -hmm. that's that was probably that's probably a good sign. Now, you know, one thing that I absolutely just loved about the book is, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, you, uh, it's a beautiful combination of levity. I mean, you're open about the darkness and the dark night of the soul, but you also were just around so many incredible artists, and I loved the anecdotes. You you mentioned that one night you were playing at a club, and this little anonymous guitarist comes in named Jimi Hendrix yeah. with his team and does a solo on Tell It Like It Is. What, what was that like? It was amazing. That's all I can say. You know, it was like uh, I was mesmerized meeting him, and he was mesmerized meeting me. So, I mean, I had to come. I heard you were singing here, and I had to come and check it out. And, uh, he played a solo on Tell It Like It Is, and I've also done a Knock On Wood by Eddie Floyd, and he played solo on that. Was he? I mean, uh, what was? I mean, was was this at the peak of his game? Was this? Was he just like breaking the rules and just stunning everyone? Well, I mean, it was just that was nineteen sixty seven, so I don't know how many rules he was breaking, but he showed pretty good <laughs> on it on two two songs. It was real oh, cool. Man. That's really cool. Uh, another uh, another fascinating anecdote I enjoyed is I fly a lot. I just got to fly uh, internationally. And while uh, flight amenities have improved over the years, um, there was no option to have Frankie Valli and Aaron Neville sing for me. Uh, tell I, I thought that was absolutely astounding. <laughs> tell us that story, if you wouldn't mind. Well, we were both on the plane. He recognized me. I didn't recognize him. We sat next to each other on a flight from New Orleans to Cal to LA. So that was about a four hour flight. And we started talking about songs and all, the next thing you know, we were singing them. And we had a whole plan up in, <laughs> around <laughs> our seats as an audience. You know, the, the, um, the, uh, the people, you know what you call them, the students or, yeah. yeah, flight attendants, yeah. Yeah, was this in first class? Yeah. All right, so you have to be in first class if you want to hear Frankie Valli and Aaron Neville uh, one night only, uh, <laughs> live from live from the first class cabin. Right? Everybody came up, though. that was the thing about. It. <laughs> hey, I like that. Turn off that fasten seatbelt sign because we got a concert going up there. Do you remember what songs you sang? We've done all kind of stuff. We've done a couple of his and oh man, and it's a lot of doo wop stuff. Oh man, fantastic! Well, flying's not the same today. That's you don't get the same amenities. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, I'll call, um, I'll call it airport agony. Airport. Oh, man, you're telling me. Um, so, Aaron, one thing I, I so appreciate the raw transparency and vulnerability, uh, especially with your battle with drugs uh, and addiction. Uh, was there a as you were writing this book, was there a sense of um, 
just, I don't want to say redeeming the past, but was there a processing and a catharticism that came with writing this book and, you know, examining your journey um, with addiction? Well, yeah, well, also said it took who I was and where I come from to make me who I am. So I can have compassion for the world, you know. People I know going through the same, I've been through the same thing they're going through. I'm just glad I wasn't in the 27 Club, you know. Yeah, for those who don't know, uh, tell us about this. It's very tragic. What is the 27 Club? The 27 Club, Club was like Jimi Hendrix, uh, Kurt Cobain, uh, Amy Winehouse, uh, uh, but a bunch of them died at 27 OD, you know. Yeah, no, it's a... It's the, the, the stories you tell and just, uh, I mean, I just, again, I didn't know much about your story, but uh, on one hand, it's actually incredible. Um, I mean, it's, it's such a long, long battle, but uh, I really appreciated you shared this story that uh, someone gave you a copy of a book uh, that forever kind of changed your trajectory um, and gave you a new perspective on just the miracle of human life. Tell us about that. Well, I went into rehab in New Orleans at the, at DePaul Hospital, it used to be a sanitarium. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I was in there for about a week or so, and this, this elderly white lady came up to me. She said, Aaron, when you first come in there, I was scared of you. I said, well, I've got to know you. I feel your heart, and I know you're a nice guy. So I want to share this book. My daughter bought it for me. It was called The Greatest Miracle by Og Mandino, O.G. Mandino. And in the book, uh, it was a story about a guy named Simon Potter who uh, called him a rag picker, where he would go around and try to, you know, I, I was looking at him as being Jesus. But on the back of the book, it was God Memorandum, and it was telling you how you are a miracle. Say when it, when your mom and dad got together to make you, say they had so many billion cells trying to make it, but you made it. So, hey, you're a miracle. Amen. Absolutely. Uh, and it's, I mean, do you look back to, and uh, I know uh, one of your favorite prayers is the footsteps in the sand. Uh, if you would mind uh, sharing that with our listeners too, because I think it's so interesting for your story. Yeah, well, like I said, the footprints in the sand. Well, you know the story of the guy walking along the beach with the Lord. And uh, he see, I'm looking back at it and I see, I see in the worst times of my life, I only see one set of footprints. And God said, yeah, that was the times I was carrying you. So I know each time he carried me through hell and damnation. Absolutely. Um, you know, you're so open about your faith, and I so appreciate this. Uh, and I want to definitely get uh, a, a couple stories about this. Uh, there were uh, actually, first off, tell me about your Catholic faith, and in particular, uh, St. Jude is really special for you. Well, uh, going to St. Monica Catholic School um, as a kid. It gave me a lot of morals and, you know, and one thing that the choir used to sing in Ave Maria, I never knew the words except for the refrain part, but it used to do something to my heart, you know, it was just, can't explain it. And later on in life, it, uh, I found myself sitting in the gutter one time, I just lost, you know, and, and I started singing Ave Maria to myself. Nobody was even around. And I got and walked out that gutter and it was cool, you know. And St. Jude, well, I guess you can call me back in the day, I might have been a sort of a hopeless case. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mama, brought, she brought me to a lady at Guadalupe Church on Rampart Street in New Orleans, and there was a St. Jude shrine. Then there was a, on Ursuline and Johnson, there was a shrine called St. Anne Shrine, where you crawl the steps on your knees, and on each step you say a prayer. She would bring me there often, you know, and like sometimes I go by myself and uh, St. Jude, because my mom said he was saying that impossible. And uh, that's what I needed. And that's him right here. It's here, right? And uh, you have a couple stories in the book which are just astounding. Uh, in particular, you have uh, several cases where you were being. Uh, you were in for, uh, you'd been convicted and you were there for sentencing and judges known for their sternness and strictness suddenly had a, a change of heart. Tell us about that. Well, um, when I went to California with Larry Williams in 1962, I actually got busted for a burglary in 63. 
and it was, it was two counts of second degree burglary. And uh, my mom and my wife Joelle at the time was wrote letters to Judge Brand, who's the judge, and and uh, the lawyer said and everything gonna be cool, the probation and all. And, but when I got to court up in California, Judge Brand was on vacation. <laughs> And this other guy was giving out time like it was ice water, 10 to 20, 5 to life. You know, and 1 to, 4, he's 1 to 14, the guy told me he knew nobody got 1 to 14 that did less than nine years, you know. So I'm standing in front of the first of all, I was talking about running. I said, man, I'm going to get out of here. And I said, no, I, if I run, I can't sing, so I got to take my, my rap. You know? And he, this other judge, he sent me with the law prescribed, and he told everybody else. Since it's one to 14 years in San Quentin penitentiaries. And I, uh, you see, but, <laughs> and I'm holding on to a piece of kite three for DLA. But what, man? He said, I suspend that sentence, put you on a three year probation, providing you do the first year for the county. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Lord St. Jude. And oh, man. the next one was, uh, after Hurricane Betsy in 1965, me and my boy Melvin, we, was, we had this, this weed. We were selling dollar joints, you know. And uh, I went up to town where my wife George grew up at, and I was on the corner. And meanwhile, there had a guy named Tangle Eye Red, who some guy dropped a handkerchief and let the narcotics police know that he was on that corner. But he just got in the car and pulled off. By me being there and kind of ready to jump on me. I had about 30 joints, so I could And meanwhile, my brother Charles was doing a five-year hard labor bit in Angola for two marijuana cigarettes. You know, so I just knew I was going to get 10. And my daddy got me a lawyer. They called him the man with the big hat in the courthouse. And he come up with a motion to suppress and got me off on that. And the next one was uh, my mom had just died a year before. This guy named Lil Sonny was a singer. He kept calling and said, man, you know, somebody got some coke. And I knew a guy had some coke. I kept telling him no, then I gave in. And I scored for him. I scored for him a couple of times. And he brought his boy, Freddie, in. Freddie won't score, you know. And mother wit. You have the mother wit. You're supposed to get that feeling that it didn't come till too late. Because after I scored for Freddie twice, then one day I just was feeling it. Something wasn't right. And I got a call from him. He said, hey, man, can you get some? I said, no, man, the guy's out of town. He said, well, you know, I can get some hair on. When he said that, I knew what it was. So I said, no, man, I'm doing Sonny a favor and I've done you a favor. That's, that's what it was. And uh, next thing I know, there had about 20 people that running through the alleys and knocked, banging on the door and opened the little window and looked at Freddie. He was standing there with a steel gray suit. With a star skin hush gun on the side. I said, Hey, Freddie. I said, No, that ain't Freddie. That's Officer So and So. I said, I know who he is. And uh, my lawyer said, Well, pray that you don't get this judge. As soon as I got my papers, Judge Edward G. Boyle, the hanging judge. And uh, me and Joel started going to St. Anne's Shrine and St. Jude. And I went to court, he found me guilty on two sales of narcotics to an agent. And he said, I sent you to one to, one to 15 years in the federal penitentiary. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to suspend that sentence and put you on a three year probation. I said, Thank you, Your Honor. When me and Joel were walking out the court, this black dude, he was the federal marshal, he had a mean look on his face. He said, I don't know what you had in this courthouse, but you. But these shackles were for your ass. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> you ain't going to see me no more. I know what kind of cold I was. <laughs> that was it. Oh, man. Yeah. Man, do you, do you think, I mean, do you just look back and say God just softened the hearts of these judges? Like, would you call it a miracle? Oh, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, my God and angel. I guess I wore them out some, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I know. Have you ever tallied up your legal bills, do you think? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, I wouldn't even, that's not even, not even think about the legal bills, whatever it took, you know. 
Yeah, to get out there. Um, one thing I found interesting too is, I mean, you have such, I mean, it's such a fact. You were up in Castaic, you know, doing lumber work and training to fight fires, and you got a hit record on the radio, right? Well, it wasn't a hit record, but it was, you know, it was played. So it was one of my yeah. th- songs I did with Alan Toussaint for Minute Records. And uh, the, the sergeant who was over the compound where I was, he dubbed me, you know, he said, he said, hey, what you doing in a place like this? I said, I've done something stupid now, I gotta pay for it, you know? So he used to get me to come and buff his the floors in the office. And uh, while we in there, the record come on, the man said, that was Mr. Aaron Neville. He said, no, that's Mr. 016955. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have the same branding to it, you know. <laughs> so it's a little, a little harder to get that. Um, wow. I uh, so when you when you think back now um, and you look uh, one area, I f- you said something in the book which I found really uh, just inspiring. To you said, you know, you had some people take advantage of you. Obviously, you're very open that you made some mistakes and made some bad choices, yeah. but you also had some people in the music industry take advantage of you. And you talk about how you think God may have withheld financial blessing at times because you weren't ready to steward it. Is that something that, you know, you would tell the younger or the next generation that, Hey, if you're not seeing breakthrough, maybe in an area that you want, just consider that God may be protecting you. Right. I mean, I, did, I know he protected me. People say, you're not bitter. Then no. Cause I know if I'd have got that, you know, kind of money back in the days, I probably would have been in the 27 club. Uh, mm. You know, I, I went through, got through it. Oh man. Well, it says, right. Scripture says the Lord disciplines those he loves. And, uh, I guess some, it takes a little more discipline, right? right. No doubt. <laughs> oh man. Uh, you, uh, going back to just, you have so many incredible, um, artists, uh, you got to be around, uh, Santana, Ray Charles, Stevie wonder. Uh, could you tell us about just some of your interactions with us? I mean, sting, I mean, it's like you, you basically were playing in rock and roll heaven. It's not like the the band that's going to play for eternity, you know? Well, I did a couple of things with Sting. We were on the Amnesty tour with Sting, U2, who is the police, you know, U2, Peter Gabriel, John, John Baez, Miles Davis, and uh, let me see. And later, Sting and his wife had this thing for the benefit for the rainforest. And I did a thing at Carnegie Hall with him. Pavarotti, Elton John, Whitney Houston, uh, wow. Linda Wynette, it was, you know. That's incredible. Is uh, I'm a huge Sting fan too. Is he, uh, he seems, in, in, I mean, obviously he's incredibly talented. Uh, what was that like playing with Sting? It was cool. I mean, you know, we didn't actually play with him. We, we were on the same show, but we hung out. You know, him and Artie got, got real tight, my brother. Oh, yeah. He seems like an interesting guy, you know, really into philosophy and kind of like yeah. a really, you know, cerebral guy. Yeah, he's into yoga and all that stuff, you know. Oh, yeah, the tantric <laughs> meditation and stuff, yeah. yeah. Hey, it works on the, uh, you know, his his songs. Um, and uh, and Santana, you said in the book, actually said, I want you to open and close for mm-hmm. us. Like, Santana was a huge fan of y'all. Yeah, he was like a brother, man. We did so many gigs together from in the States, Jamaica, Switzerland. And we'd always bump into each other and we, you know, get on stage together. Like with the day, pray for day. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you have a great story in the book about a grateful dead fan who comes yeah. up to you and says, uh, Hey, do you remember me? Yeah. Uh, I'm the one in the tie dye shirt. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was like, hey man, I was at the concert when y'all looked up for the dead. See, I was the one right in the front with the tie dye. <laughs> oh, you were the one. Oh, you were the one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I remember when um, Trace uh, got with the dead, they told us, said, don't eat nothing or drink nothing from nobody. <laughs> and we, when we got within two blocks of the place, it looked like we were on a time walk with the tie dyes and the swirl and swirl is going on, you know? No, oh, <laughs> that must have been a trip. Uh, I uh, I wanted to ask you, too, you... Um, Something I, I read uh, to, uh, and again, folks, there's so much in this book. I'm giving you just like sprinkles. There, I mean, you have to, you won't believe these stories. There's so many, I mean, it's a full, it's a full life. Uh, I really appreciated that even though you got to be a front man at some point, you were adamant that everyone get paid 
uh, as you split it oh, yeah. with everyone. Yes. I thought that was so cool. We were the brothers, you know, and I never wanted nothing more than the rest of them. Man, so, that's, 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 so, that's so cool. So you just would split everything that came yeah. in. Yeah, that's, uh, that's like amazing. Like you say, we were forced to reckon with the, the, the mighty, mighty never brothers. They didn't get their due, you know, but anybody that was at one of our shows, they know that the never brothers yeah. kicked ass. That's right. Um, a crazy, I mean, this is really eerie to think about, but you were actually uh, getting to know Otis Redding pretty well. Yeah, it was uh, like a month, maybe not, might have been a little more than a month. You know, oh, he was yeah. just a Don Murray guy, you know, country, country guy. He was real cool. Oh. Yeah. Did you ever see him in, I'm uh, blanking on the name with Carla, his, uh, this, the, the one he oh, sang the duets said, with? Yeah. yeah, she was a yeah. uh, friend of ours. She wanted me to record her song, G Wiz. So yeah, I want you to record it. You know, I never did, but she was cool too. Oh yeah, I mean those duets are amazing. But what was it like seeing Otis Red? I mean, because you saw you were with him at the top of his game. I mean, he was just—I mean, one of the most incredible voices ever. And I didn't realize this. He had—he had just recorded "Sitting on the Dock of the Bay" and yes. never got to record. No. Yeah, and like next thing I know, he playing my down with him and the Barkays. And I, yeah. I was supposed to be on that too. I don't know if I'd have been on that plan with him, but something happened and I didn't go on that tour. So. Probably one of my guardian angels looking out for me, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, just... Uh, so, I mean, obviously, I, I could pick your brand on music all the time, but is there a particular one artist that you saw live that just... Uh, or just a, a show that stands out that you were just blown away and is in your top your top of all time? Well, if you notice, like, uh, Michael Jackson, James Brown, uh, who else... Uh, all the guys you see doing the thing with the microphone going back. Oh yeah, was a guy named Joe Tex. He's he's the one that started that. I mean, he was like a wizard. He had that microphone like it was magic. You know, you'd be like standing looking at him like that. And how you do that? Because he'd run from one side of the stage and play with the girl, and he'd run other side, and he'd come back and, and he'd fall on his knees and slide, and the microphone <laughs> fall right in his hand. I said, man, it was like magic, and uh. When they did the movie, the Jacksons, the father told Michael, he said, no, no, that's not the way Joe Tex did it. And he, I had a tear in my eye. I said, yeah, give that man his props. Because nobody don't even know that, you know. Oh, man. Yeah, did he sing, there's a song at See That Woman Over There, Don't She Look Good? Is lady, that? Uh... He said, uh, who want the lady with the skinny legs? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, yeah, that's, uh, wow, I didn't know that. That's crazy. Um so you uh I I know there's a, there's a this is comical but sad that uh, you had an actual opportunity to record or potentially work with Frank Sinatra uh and uh, the and it just got lost in the shuffle is that one of those sort of it, cosmic it just bad runs the shuffle. my manager at the time Joe Jones he was looking out for for him you know and he he kept that from me like uh, one of the Dixie Cups uh, Barbara Hawkins the, the girl group the Dixie Cup, she told me what happened. But it was too late. It, you know, like I say, I wasn't ready back then. I think God knew I wasn't ready. Yeah. No, I mean that's that's amazing. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I mean, it would I'm trying to imagine Aaron Neville and Frank Sinatra singing to you. I think my mind well, would blow up. Much respect for Frank. Um, Hope Hoboken, New Jersey. Oh, uh, what a voice. Uh and uh as we I wanna wrap I'll wrap up on some of the music uh fandom here but uh you know one time you were playing and you got word that there was this petite little singer in the audience named linda ronstadt and uh you uh and then so destinies intersected at that point uh tell us about that very fateful meeting 1984 at the world's fair in new orleans the brothers were playing at pete Fountain's club that was on the grounds and linda ronstadt was playing with nelson riddle at the amphitheater after her show Somebody told us we were playing, she came to see us. They told me she was in the audience, so I dedicated a song to it and I called up on stage. Which she told the audience that she never did that before in prompt stuff like that without rehearsal. But she wasn't gonna say no to Aaron Neville. So, and after that I asked for autograph. She said to Aaron, love, I'll sing with you anytime, any place, anywhere, in any key. And that's how it all started. And next year, 
me and Alan Tucson had a started an organization called New Orleans Artists Against Hunger and Homeless. And we asked people to come down and do benefits for it. And she came down for that. And we were in the studio book with Alan Tucson. And the first thing we sang together was the Ave Maria, by her being Catholic and me being Catholic. And we sang it in harmony. And our manager, Peter Asher, said, oh, wow, y'all should do a record together. And I'm trying to be cool. I'm geek like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm ready for that. So that's how that went down. Yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, the rest is history, obviously. Uh, I don't know much is uh, incredible. In fact, I, the videos watch so much on YouTube. And I, I loved in the book, you, I did, you don't look nervous at all, but you said walking out on that stage, okay. you were just petrified and said, I see this big, strong guy walking out and you just, you kill it. And it's funny. She looks at the audience, but you're just looking at her the whole time. And it's, it's an was, incredible. It's my safety net. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking at that audience. <laughs> Well, it's fun. I had we were actually watching a video um, recently of, of of you two singing, and obviously Linda Ronstadt, one of the greatest voices of all time. Yeah. I mean, you, it's absolutely a force of nature. And yet, it's funny. I was watching it with a group of friends, and they all said, "You know, Linda's amazing, but it sounds like she's trying to keep up with Aaron Neville here because that is just you know, it's like you were you know just holding court there. So it was uh, you were as you say connecting the dots. Yeah. And uh, it was it was absolutely it's such an incredible performance. But I'm curious, did you get nervous before going on stage, or does that fade over time? Fade because you just, you know, once I get out and start singing, it was all gone. Like, okay. Like we went to uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, Australia, New Zealand for about it was over about a month. The first night, my back went out, so I had to go over in a wheelchair. And, and they put a chair out on the stage and I sit down my, my leg with the, what you call it, a sciatica. Felt like my legs were opening up. I had to put my hands on them. I didn't like the idea of sitting on the wheelchair. So I said, set a chair out there and I walked to the, and I walked out. And once I sat down and see the people and start singing, I didn't think about the pain until it was over. <laughs> the um, pain came back. Ah, that's. Uh, yeah, I know you. You had some serious. Uh, I'm trying to imagine you too. You said you love visiting Japan, and uh, the hotel rooms are a little smaller over there. And I'm trying to picture the mighty Aaron Neville in a tiny little uh, hotel room in Japan. Well, I had to be very careful just trying to turn around. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, later on when um, we went over, we, uh, we had uh, big hotels for us. You know, but the first time we went, it was like the room was like a bathroom. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was doing some uh, some deep cut digging, and I found an incredible performance with you, Bonnie Raitt, Greg Allman, and, and uh, Dennis Quaid was there too. I, I saw a young Dennis Quaid. What was that show? That was uh, the Neville Brothers and with friends. Uh, was Ed Bradley was in the audience, and it was just like a special show because uh, Greg Allman sang "Tell It Like It Is" with me. And, I remember that was fantastic. And me and Cyril sang. Uh, Song with him, uh, one more silver dollar, you know. Oh, yeah, midnight that's uh, that show. midnight ride, Mid the midnight rider, man. Oh, that midnight was, yeah, favorite. that was Greg always just got such a soulful, oh, deep yeah. voice, and it was such a powerful show. The last time I saw him was in Australia. Oh, man, him and BB King, it's really. Mm. Are there uh, artists that you keep in touch with now that you're still uh, really close with, or uh, anyone kind of your? Your circle that you are regularly touching base with? I keep in touch with Linda, Paul Simon, uh, Dave Matthews. Um, Dave Matthews. So I didn't realize, did you two do some uh, songs together or we just did, friends? We, we did a couple of shows together because he recorded a Daniel Lanois song. And uh, I sang on Daniel Lanois' verse, so they liked that and invited me to. I think it was Radio City Music Hall with this show. Oh, he's incredible. Dave Matthews is an amazing show. One of the lo longest shows, too. He and he and Bruce Springsteen, I think I went to shows with them, and they did about three and a half hours. I was like, <laughs> how do you keep playing? Well, the Neville Brothers used to do that in New Orleans, like Tipitina. We, we'd be out there till daylight, and I remember some time it didn't have the air conditioning. When I got home, I had to ring my jeans out from sweat. That's it. Oh, yeah. 
Um, now I do have to ask, just obviously given your, uh, your, your New Orleans heritage here, uh, do you have a particular favorite gumbo or jambalaya? This could be very controversial. I know. No, I mean, if it's good, I, I, I'll eat it. But I, the only thing I can cook is red beans. Cause when, I, <laughs> when my wife, Joel was working at charity hospital, she would call me on the phone and give me the instructions how to do it. You know, so now I can make red beans. There you go. Hey, it's like, well, my dad can barely boil pasta. Yeah, so, you know, hey, it, it, it works there. Uh, well, Aaron, uh, I'm going to, well, I'll close this one and then I'll do a little section uh, for the um, our Catholic podcast, uh, which has a really huge following and we can uh, give them a little taste of something. But um, Aaron, thank you for sharing your journey. This book is absolutely incredible. Uh, it's, I mean, you do, you tell it like it is. I appreciate the writing style too. It is just, you know, it's a lot of books try and, dress it up and use a lot of unnecessary like filler. And this book's just no, you just, you straight up say just story after story after story. Uh, and, um, and actually I'd be remiss. I meant to ask you, uh, you're very, I really appreciate your, you're very honest about your relationship with law enforcement and how, uh, there's a lot of bad cops and, you know, you were taken advantage of significantly, oh, yeah. uh, growing up there, but you also go to great lengths to say that, there's a lot of good cops too, oh, yeah. and you actually have a, and you have a, a sheriff's badge, right? Yeah, sheriff's or a, badge. I have a special agent badge from the Louisiana State from a friend of uh, Fran LaSalle, which I, I helped uh, Richard Ayu to get in to be the Attorney General, and then know that we were doing things to try to help the kids because I started the youth center, and uh, so they gave me and my brother all uh, special agent badges. And I had a New Orleans plus Jefferson Parish badge. All right, special special agent Neville, right mm -hmm. at large, yeah. right? Watch bad bad guys beware. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's that's really cool. Uh, I'd also be remiss to ask uh, two of my all time favorite artists. Uh, did you ever uh, get to sing with or be around Prince at all? No, I haven't. But I, I much respect for Prince. Oh yeah, one of those. And then my mom was actually very close with, or is very close with Bill Medley uh, and the Righteous Brothers. Did you ever uh, sing with Bill or be around Bill? I've been around him, yeah. I didn't sing with them, but uh, yeah, you know, so many people. Like I remember, like George Jones was a special treat to meet him. You know, I did a thing in honor, honor of him, <laughs> and he came on the stage, and I had asked him, I said, "Well, why do they call you the Possum?" He said, well, hell, I look like a darn possum. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I just wanted to meet that young fella that's singing my song better than me. <laughs> yeah, that's high praise. Yeah, you've been praised by Bob Dylan, George Jones, Linda Ron. I mean, Linda Ronstadt doesn't, go, doesn't do impromptu unless it's Aaron Neville. Bob Dylan uh, says, you know, you're basically, you know, one of the, the greatest singers. Keith Richards says... I'm going to bring Aaron Neville records if I'm trapped on a desert <laughs> island, you know, and, and Keith Richards needs good music because that guy will never die and he'll just live forever on that island. So that's, that's really high praise. Yeah. And then George Jones says, you sing his songs better than he does. So you've got, you got some incredible praise and it's well-deserved. You are truly yeah. one of the great, great voices. Um, and, um, you know, as we wrap up here, Aaron, tell me about, you make a lot of, there's a lot of religious language you talk about with singing and how it helps you feel closer to the divine. You, you quote uh, St. Augustine that uh, he who prays, you know, prays once, he who sings, prays twice. Uh, I just, talk to me about the spiritual connection between you and singing and uh, just what you're wired to do. Well, singing for me, I don't, it's all in my lowest part of my life. It lifted me, you know. It, that's why I call it medicine. Because it would like, my soul would be healed. I can't explain it, you know. And, uh, like people say, man, I wish I could tell you what your your voice do for me. I say, I wish I could tell you what it do for me, you know. Because by me doing it, it's like a cleansing. It's like a like the Holy Ghost, you know. Yeah, you call it connecting the dots, right? right? And in the singing, you call it uh, vocal gymnastics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, well, Aaron, any uh, parting words you want to say to the next generation and things you want people to, you know, if anyone right now is just having a tough time and they're wondering where God is, that maybe they're the only footprints in the sand right now, uh, what would you say to them? Look deep in your soul. God is there. You know, I feel him all the time. And uh, 
even through my darkest hours, you know, I knew he was there protecting me. Like I said one time in a, in a shooting gallery in New York, down in the boiler room with a bunch of junkies down there doing their stuff. And, and I'm praying to get out. I looked at the wall and I saw a crack shaped like a cross. I started praying. To, I said, Lord, get me out of here. I mean, it took a while because I feel like I had to see what I saw to have compassion. So that's why I say it took who I was and where I come from to make me who I am. Mm. Amen. Awesome. Awesome, my man. Well, God bless you, sir. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon.